Hello, everyone. Welcome to PayPod. I'm your host, Jacob Hollaball. And today on the show, we are putting our investor caps back on as we once again look to answer some questions around what kind of companies, what kind of leaders, what kind of ideas are worth investing in in today's fintech world. We've got an amazing guest joining us who happens to be one such person leading investments into this space. We are joined by Megan Cow, principal at Contrary Capital. Megan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Pleasure is all ours, and I'm very excited. We've begun a little bit of a, a a streak here. I think this is going to be the third month in a row that we have brought someone on in similar shoes to yours of looking at things through the investment lens, and they've been fantastic conversations, and I'm really looking forward to another one here with you. So to give us started, could you just give us a little bit of a background and general overview on who Contrary is, what you do there, and kind of your role as principal, the company you work with, et cetera? Yeah, of course. I'm Megan. I'm a principal on our investing team. I mainly focus on our later stage investments. So depending on what type of VC you talk to, sometimes later stage is Series A and beyond. And for us at Contrary, that's Series A and beyond. So quickly about Contrary, we are a multi-stage VC firm today, but early stage VC is still the most of what we do. It's in our roots. It's in our fundamental philosophies. And so for us, Contrary, uh, talent is at the core of everything we do. And so think of our philosophy as making a bet on the person before the idea. And so you're like, what does that even mean? And so for us, over the past six years, we've built a community of 500 folks across product engineering, design, you name it. And oftentimes we meet these community members uh, when they're 18 years old in undergraduate, in graduate schools. And we try to find these really exceptional talent early in their career and be with them through these critical decision points in their journey, whether it's, you know, how to incorporate a company, like which idea should I think about? How do I find a co-founder? And so the bet is that we've been with them through these different stages. And so when they do want to found, you know, four to six years later, we want to be their champion and their first check. Now on the flip side, most of these people actually just want to go work at awesome early stage companies. And so we've been able to help companies like Ramp, who we invested in hire six of their first 40 to 50 engineers. And so my background, I come from a more later stage world from Goldman Sachs and DoorDash. It was never really apparent to me how hard it is to hire not only your first five hires, but maybe your first 20, your first 25. And so helping companies from that angle um, is something that we do from very, um, day one. And as you can imagine, this kind of thesis is a very bold bet. Sometimes you'll work with someone exceptional, but you never know what ideas they're going to come out with. Uh, but it's something that we very much believe in, something something that we've held um, core to our thesis. Wow, that is definitely, I mean, that's fascinating and a really cool approach to it. And that was, you know, one of the things I was going to ask is I had seen, you know, your personal profile within the company was a little more in the later stage, but that the company was built on this, you know, seed stage. And like the fact that you actually truly mean seeds, like some people say that, but like in your case, it actually means like it's so cool to build the idea of building that community of like, we want to get with these people early, these talented people that could one day be founders for companies we invest in or could be then the other half, I think that is probably not thought of by many investment firms or anything of like, what if we have a relationship with, with someone who's never some big founder of a company, but is just an amazingly talented person who can then be the help that a founder we do work with needs because yeah, those first few hires, I mean, it's as simple as just the, you know, if you're hiring your first five people, the value those people need to bring is way, way more than when you're some massive corporation. You're like, we're hiring one person. It's a very important role, but there's 5,000 of us here. Ultimately, if this doesn't work out, it's not going to ruin the business. If you're second hire, third hire, fourth hire, fifth hire, doesn't work out, it very well may ruin that business. So that's a fascinating approach. And are you, I mean, that's obviously a differentiating factor for the firm. Is that, uh, are you kind of one of the few out there approaching the landscape in this way? Are there others like you at all? And is it just a brand new approach to me? So I'd guess that's kind of what makes you stand out. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Every single VC has a talent function, but most of the time when you do get exposed to the talent function as a founder is like usually when the company has already invested in you. Mm. And so there's so many VCs out there, right? Money is green. When you just go meet the founder, when they need the money, 
they're not going to necessarily take your money, especially when you're a new VC. Like, who are you? What's your brand? Like, what are you going to bring to the table? And so we try to meet them very early on. Founders do remember when you help them hire their first founding engineer, founding designer, and all those things. But now, six years later, the reason why we start building out our later stage practice is because now our founders are entering Series B and Series C. And if they're successful, the company is like 200 people. And honestly, like they don't need the talent function as much. And so when we thought about reshaping the firm last year, we went through a massive exercise. I think everyone's seen the stats from Twitter. Some people saying, you know, 50 to 75 percent of active private market investors will disappear in the next two to five years. And so we took a step back and started thinking from first principles approach right? If you can meet the founder, first of all, very early. So we've cracked that part for the most part, but now you're moving towards later stage startups where founders not just need talent, but maybe what they need is distribution. So is distribution just getting the word out through company memos, pieces, events, and all those things. Maybe that's more important for them at the series B and series C. And so as you saw, we started contrary research last year in September. It's been less than a year and we published 200 memos on companies. And sometimes we even interview the founders. And sometimes we do deep dives like the CFOPs, DevOps, cybersecurity, and all those things. And so it's a great way for founders to get their stories told. And so it's in their incentive to maybe talk to us, share the story. And we try to have a pretty bipartisan view about the company, the competitive landscape, and all those things. But it also ties into what we call it the contrary flywheel. And so if you think about our offerings, we have three core offerings. Like one is talent, two is research, and three is events. So depending on what the founder needs, how do we pull them into this flywheel introducing them to other parts of the offerings that might be helpful for them. And so for something like contrary research, we might have a memo on X company, but now you can go on there and be like, if you like this memo, you think this company is interesting, here are the open goals. And so it's great for founders because they can also share this memo with prospective candidates. If you're excited, you can apply here. And so it gets a whole five wheel spinning and uh, it's been less than a year, but we've had resounding positive feedback from folks. That's amazing. And I've got to say, as someone who uh, works in the content space, mostly the that amount of output, especially on things that are like need to be researched and thought out and are, you know, intelligent briefings and reports and things to be put out, that kind of output in your first year is uh, pretty amazing. So hats off to you and the team for doing that. And then I just love overall the idea of like all of that to me rings is like you're providing value out instead of being that firm that's like, yeah, we meet you when you walk in our office one day with an idea and want money from us. And we have all of this homework to do to figure out if we like you, we like the idea, everything. You're like, no, let we'll build a community. We'll provide value to that community in many ways, whether you're actually working with us or not. And that also though, gives us then the head start of, if we do want to work with you, we know you better, you know, us better. You, you know, we have a relationship. So I think that's a really cool, cool setup. And, uh, I'm glad to hear it's so far it is going successfully. Now you've obviously through these first couple, couple minutes here, laid out one of the questions I like to ask someone in your position is, you know, are you, when you're considering an investment, are you looking at the idea or the founder? And I'm guessing based on everything we've talked about so far, you're looking at the founder. So if I could tweak that question a little bit then, um, and looking really at the financial fintech kind of industry more specifically here, when you're looking at that founder, what are like the types of characteristics you're looking for? What are, is there specific skill sets? Is it like personality traits, uh, how they think about things? What are kind of the things that draw you or attract you to someone who you're like, I don't, they don't have an idea right now, but I want, I want that person to be in our community because I feel like they could be someone who does something really amazing, create something really amazing. Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's, um, a chart that shows you from left from seed to later scale or later stage, what are the characters you look for? And at first, it's always a founder. I mean, we've been burned. I think VC has been burned. Everyone knows oftentimes like you have a okay founder, but a great idea, but that alone, great idea is not alone to save the company when the company, the founder isn't a visionary leader, execution, et cetera, and all of those things. And so, so it starts with the founder then starts with the founder idea, founder idea team, founder idea, product, market, and execution. And so at 
contrary, it's interesting because I kind of straddle both sides. And so you kind of have to put both hats on. In the later stages, obviously, you have the product. I want to see the financials and all those things. But in the early stages, as everyone knows, like there is nothing. In fact, like sometimes you might even have a slide, which is like one or two pages or maybe a memo at best. And so for characteristics, I look for in a founder, at least for the contrary, at least, um, to be completely honest, because our fund is much smaller than, let's say, like in Dreesen, they have $3 billion in the growth venture fund. We have to keep our bar very high in terms of that founder caliber. I think when we interview founders or we talk to founders, the number one thing I look for is clarity of thought. I want to make sure the founder is deliberate and intentional about intentional, intentional about why he's building it this way. And so questions I ask are things like, what it, why is this the first wedge into your broader vision? Why is this the first step? What are the risks and considerations that you have thought about? And all those types of banter, like back and forth. I want to see that the founder has thought about all those different current considerations. Am I going to hold him to his product roadmap? No. Like all those things can change so much in like six months to one year to year. But I'm trying to understand your logic, your train of thought, how you will hire that great team. Are you a great storyteller? Like what's your vision? If you can't even articulate that to you, Esther, you're not just selling to investors, but you're also selling to your future hires, right? How do you motivate your employees that you it's worth it's worth it going through this with you for two to four years because you're getting North Star and like all those things. Um, so clarity of thought is one thing that I look for. For two, I think this is my personal opinion coming from a lower later stage world where I was at DoorDash. Execution and operating experience is so important for me. Um, there are a lot of great young founders, and especially as contrary, I just told you, a lot of kids are like 18 years old and they're starting companies. That's awesome. Um, but I think it takes time and experience to understand how do you actually build a roadmap? What are fires that are worth putting out and what are fires that are not worth putting out? Obviously, a young founder can file, find that, figure that out through time, but especially for fintech industries or enterprise solutions, it just takes time to understand who the buyer is, how do you sell to them, what are they looking for, and oftentimes that just takes time, experience, and wisdom. And so yeah. I might press more about like, hey, you want to go from zero to one, what is your overall plan and what is your goalpost to get mm -hmm. there? And um, maybe some other VCs will say like, that's less important. It's going to change anyways. But I think that intentionality is really important to me because if you don't even have that in mind, that's going to be very hard to communicate to your future employees. Yeah. Love that. And you use the word roadmap in the first one, which I really, I kind of like, and have, have remembered um, in an entrepreneur class way long ago, it rung like a very old memory, weirdly old. And I guess it, yeah, it's been a decade since I would have been in that class, but wrong this memory of think of like having the roadmap, but in like knowing, yes, that you're going to be driving down the road and there's going to be a construction that you didn't know about. And you're going to have to reroute. Like you said, like we're, we don't have to follow that. I'm not going to hold you to, this is the only path. But I want to know that you know there the path. I know you know where you're trying to get. I want to know that you have a clarity of like what is the path to get there. If we have to change it along the way, great. But it's a lot better to know that versus I know we want to get here. Like, how are you going to get it? Uh, I I don't know, but I know we want to get there. It's like okay, well, I need the first version, the first idea. So I love that. Let's um drill into fintech kind of a little little more concisely here. It's a very broad category, obviously, lots of sub-industries within the financial world. It's more and more and more every day with uh, how niche down everything has become. Are there any specific areas of the world of finance that kind of stick out to you as maybe the most ripe for change or improvement right now, or maybe kind of viewed another way, an area where you're most commonly being pitched new companies of like, we could solve this, this isn't well. Is there any area within the financial world that stands out to you as that kind of hot sector? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I was having a debate with a friend at another VC. Everyone says they're a fintech investors, but there's so many ways to slice and dice it. You can go very, very deep into infrastructure. You can go deep into payment risk, fraud, and like all those things. But when I talk to founders, or at least like when I look at an investment opportunity, I try to take a step back and actually just look at fundamentals from the top down. What does it take to actually become a venture scale business? And I think 
I agree with A16. They put out a take on this, like every single company needs to be a global company. So what do I mean by this? Um, Pre-COVID, most of the systems were, or most of the startups were you build a company in San Francisco, wherever you hire a team within San Francisco, it's all very localized. Now, post-COVID, now you see distributed workforces in Canada, international, like all those places. The fact is, for most of the solutions, whether it's in fintech or beyond, they are great. If it's like sales marketing, they are able to localize for these global outputs. But in terms of internal systems, if you think about accounting, HR, and all those things, none of them have had to deal with this Hail Mary, which is like COVID and distribution. And so when I think about the opportunity or like the right way, not necessarily like right, right way, but the opportunity at hand here, I think about companies that are ultimately trying to grab for this global pie. So that's the macro. But drilling down a little bit deeper, I think like a simple way to divide it, at least fintech applications, is B2B and B2C. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of VCs have looked at the B2B commerce route and they're like, digital adoption is too slow. The penetration is only like 5% out of like 120 million, in sales, 120 trillion in sales. It's not worth my time because the time to ramp is too slow. Yes. And I think like in the times of 2020 and 2021, when everyone was trying to do markets more quickly, like an area like B2B commerce just isn't as attractive. But if you just look at these two categories combined together, B2C is 25 trillion in online and offline sales. B2C is 120 trillion. And if you think about e-commerce adoption, just like coming online, B2B is only 5%. So there is 95% of solutions that haven't really come online. And there's obviously various ways that you can drill down on this. But the fact is a lot of these solutions haven't come online because the systems are antiquated. Now you talked, I know in the previous conversation, you talked about supply chain. That's one component. Aerospace and defense, manufacturing, all these verticals solutions. I think a lot of them, I've been talking to a lot, most of them are still dealing with pen and paper, email communications and all those things. If you think about procurement, discovery and all that stuff, no one has really built tech for them because if you're in the Bay Area or in the Silicon Valley, it's mostly tech for tech people, right? You see all these market maps, but who is ultimately the buyer? Have they actually gone out to talk to metal service providers, verticalized solutions, Probably less so. Obviously, are there VCs like TCB and Tidemark that have done amazing work within vertical solutions? But I think there's a lot of homework still to be done there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're that has been one of the other themes in recent uh, weeks and months on the podcast. Here is we've done the basically once a month having an investor on, and then at least once a month we've had someone come in and blow my mind with like they're working in specifically like B two B world of trying, and they've shared some of those numbers that you just did and other other kind of mind blowing like wow that's how far B two B is behind the B two C world, and there's lots of reasons that make perfect sense once you lay them out of like how that happened why that happened. But then you just hear the opportunity there. I hear and have started to hear from speaking to people like you and folks that are trying to actively work on the problem. Like, yeah, I view that as an opportunity. 5% penetration on, you know, what you said, $120 trillion, whatever. So 95% of 120 trillion sounds like a pretty good opportunity to me to like go in and find ways to catch them up in the digital age. So uh, glad that we're, we're finding some consensus amongst different guests on the show here of like, that's definitely, definitely the place to be the place that needs help and that there's a lot of value that can be brought. Let's turn to, um, a couple other trends and a couple, uh, other items. The first of which is something that you referenced earlier, the amazing output of content and reports and different things that the research team has had there in the last year since its founding. One of those was, uh, I was reading recently on LinkedIn, your deep dive you did on kind of the changing role of the CFO. Could you share some of the takeaways from that at a high level, just how the role of CFO has changed and kind of what a few of the catalysts for that change have been? Yeah, for sure. So at a high level, The CFO has evolved over the past two decades. And if you actually work in finance, this is not new news for you, at least in tech finance. And so in the old world of CFO, or I wouldn't even say old in traditional industry of CFOs, uh, they were essentially number crunchers, 
right? Not to throw shade at my CFOs. I work with them across the table all the time. Uh, but their job is essentially twofold. Make sure you didn't run them out of money and to make sure how you spent your money correctly. And so strategic decision-making in terms of the direction of the business, where we should invest those dollars, go to market, sales, and all those things was largely outside the CFO school. That was given to the CRO, the CIO, and all those different departments. But I think what you're seeing is that, especially in the past five to 10 years, there's been an explosion of data, a Cambrian explosion of data. You have companies like DBT, Fivetran, Snowflake. The amount of unstructured data is unwielding. And so the question is like, what do you do with all this consumer and business data? How do you drive action on that? And so what you've seen, especially in the last five to 10 years, the onus has gradually started falling on the CFO. And so the term I used is they're no longer just the chief financial officer driven by accounting backgrounds, but increasingly the chief performance officer. What do I mean by that? Someone who is actually the connected tissue across the other organizations driving change in terms of how they should think about long-term trade-offs. So if you want to get to, I don't know, steady state margins of EBITDA positive, how do we actually set goalposts that encourage the different departments to work towards that goal? So I essentially call them like the quarterback throughout the entire process. I think something that was interesting to me is that this kind of stuff was not new information for me. I worked at DoorDash and I think in Silicon Valley, a lot of CFOs come from a younger persona where they understand the value of being data forward. But the fact is, some of the feedback I got from the piece was so surprising because in some of the industries, they're like, wow, like this is new information. I actually still see myself in the traditional CFO roles, which is great because pieces like this is meant to have people start having conversations about where they are on the spectrum and where they should be. I think the second piece of that is ultimately CFO tooling. So financial tooling and obviously financial planning, procurement, all these various buckets fit into like the CFO stack. I would honestly exclude traditional fintech products like payments, all those things, because it's less so a CFO buyer that Mm -hmm. deals more with the CIO and other like cross-functional departments. Uh, But as you look towards these tools, why? about this now, right? A lot of VCs have put out pieces about the CFO stack and broadly, but there is a very real change happening, especially in the past two, three years. If you look at any budgeting for like the C-suite, usually it's always like the CIO, like cloud security spending, like all that stuff is going up, rightfully so. But in terms of the finance department, budget has never really increased, right? because finance ultimately is not really seen as a revenue generating department for most companies. But now there are two tailwinds, I would say, actually three tailwinds, I would say that's really driving change. One is shortage of talent. Uh, Turns out investment banking isn't as fun as that used to be. And no one wants to go into big (laughs) four anymore. This is a real conversion issue. This is where all the corporate finance people like prune their like ex-bankers, ex-consultants like from. But without this top of funnel, now you have a finance team that's like overworked, overstretched and short staff, right? And so these existing tools just don't cut it. Like I was at DoorDash, we were still using very, very old solutions. that honestly just wasn't very nimble. And so in 2020 and 2021, I think a lot of CFOs were able to get away with it because... In the good times, you could just hire more people. But supply chain issues were catching up. All these different structural issues were just kind of swept under the rug. And now people are taking a hard look at new tools because in a way they're forced to. I think building for CFO tools is tough because first of all, if you're going to be selling to an enterprise, it's not like a two, three month sale. You have to build trust with the department, all those things. But if a customer does convert, that is a multi-year contract, multi-billion dollar, or multi-million dollars. And so that is very lucrative. And especially if you look at incumbents in the States, they're mostly solutions from like 20, 30 years ago. And so a lot of exciting companies are chipping away at that. Wow. Fascinating stuff. Well, definitely. Um, I, I had a great time, as I said, reading 
through uh, that report and everything. We'll definitely link to it in the show notes. Um, So if anyone listening uh, was as fascinated as I am with that little snippet of it and synopsis of it, definitely uh, use that below to go ahead and then be able to read the whole thing and everything else. Definitely follow the blog and everything else. Because again, there's a lot of content coming out over there and it's all very, very good. A couple other trends to then touch on here. One of the other big, big trends over, I would say, the last five years, it has definitely sped up significantly. It started much earlier than that, but the speed with which is really picked up over the last few years, which is the as a service is just kind of the new model for everything. We started with SaaS. It was just software as a service, but now it's everything as a service, any little thing. And especially within the world of finance and fintechs, it's every little thing being niched down. We do one thing incredibly well, specialization, integration. That's kind of the name of the game right now. Do you see that shift being one that isn't just a shift that you know is one that's here to stay or do you think there may be a period of either consolidation or a lot of acquisition in the near future to kind of go back against that and bring some of those niche as a service back into larger corporations yeah so everyone knows like every software company is unbundle rebundle unbundle etc uh Right now, especially in the past two, three years, we are already seeing a rebundling phase. Mm -hmm. And depending on who you're talking to, so I don't want to use like a blanket statement, right? So for middle market buyers, so call it like 500 employees and under, when we talk to CFO or decision makers with spend being a concern, a lot of CFOs are okay with one solution that has more breadth versus multiple point solutions. And this might be, not might be the case if you're talking to enterprise enterprise buyers, which is more complicated, but that is a real concern and a lot of startups are already taking action on it. And so if you think about like the history of like why everything has become unbundled and why it's rebundling again, it goes back to the data explosion, which happened like five to 10 years ago. SaaS application within spend management, procurement and all those things disaggregated because the mainframe systems, such as like ERPs, just couldn't do them as well. And so they needed more agile systems. But now these systems are getting very messy. You don't need like three different expense management tools is that in fact, it gets worse for you to consolidate them. And so is there a path for just picking one vendor that can do everything, maybe 75%, 80% versus like three solutions that does like one very niche solution well, it's like 100%. And so I think what you're seeing within this stack, the CFO stack, for example, is that you're already seeing companies like Ramp not only swallow spend management, but also going into procurement, also going into AR, also going into payments and all those things. And then you can make the case for Rippling, right? Now they have their own corporate cards. But when I talk to founders, uh, the core thing I'm trying to understand is back to one point that I mentioned at the very beginning. Why is this the first step into your broader vision? And a lot of that comes down to the data that you are creating or you're orchestrating, right? And so like, if you are just like a thin wrapper, I'm just like, oh, I'm just like organizing your data, but I'm not actually generating no- more data, that is less compelling to me as a buyer versus something like a ramp or a rippling where everything lives within ramp and rippling. And that's like the system of record that I can leverage other systems to plug into. And so if you get that first step wrong, then you just become a perif- peripheral feature. Right. And I think you're going to see a lot of startups die off and they're just like marginally making something a little bit like, oh, I can make your expenses faster. But like, I don't care (laughs) if I have something that can do that, like 75 percent. And so um, I think that platform power that a lot of VC talk about is very real. And a lot of startups are are learning that now. Yeah. And when you can you might be able to bring me this little marginal bit of improvement or value over here, but if I have to work with 20 different people who can all marginally increase the value of 20 different parts of my business, that little bit, am I actually trading off of, you know, the headache and having to hire someone to manage all of this, to be able to do all of this versus what that little marginal bit I'm picking up everywhere. And so, yeah, I'm with you, but that's been, it's one of my favorite questions to ask, uh, both folks like yourself who are looking at it from the investment lens and kind of the whole industry wide, but then especially I've asked a lot of folks who are, you know, trying to do this one real niche thing of like, is the, is the goal to get acquired or like, do you have that clear mindset of, you know, as you referenced, if the size of company you're interacting with or your clientele tells you whether you could stick around forever, cause they would 
tend to want you versus you get in the midsize, the bigger size, the enterprises, like maybe they wouldn't want you as much. So it's been a, it's been one of the reoccurring topics on the podcast. And I liked that answer with bit. And you mentioned there, you know, data has come up at the end there. We do definitely live in a data world at this point. Our world is driven by data in every single way, almost all the companies, every, you know, it comes up every podcast, which then leads me to a, the final kind of big trend I wanted to talk to you about, which comes up also on every single podcast in 2023, which is AI, machine learning, other evolving technologies. I think when we say AI at this point, we kind of mean all of the other ones. We just don't want to give the big list every single time of, you know, machine learning, Web3, everything that falls under the big umbrella. How do you see AI and other new technology impacting the kind of financial services landscape? And then where do you think we're at in the adoption curve of learning how to use these new technologies in actual valuable ways versus just like, this is cool. We're going to play around and one day we'll figure out how to actually do it in the right way. Where do you think we're kind of at in that adoption curve? Yeah. So to preface that, I think every VC feels like they need to have they need to take a stance on AI for financial services, AI for CFO, AI for payments, and all those things. But the fact is, if you are a bank or you are at financial institutions, you have been applying AI and ML for trading and all those things for a very long time. But I think the question is, with the explosion in generative AI, what are the new risks that were unaccounted for in your previous systems? And for generative AI, I think things that are top of mind, if I think about three characteristics that I think about when it comes to like which, which segment is most right for adoption for AI, I think the number one question I have is what is the incremental pro productivity from this AI unlock? And so can you measure it? Is it like hours reduced per worker or is a reduction in chargebacks? All those things are need to be measured for you to actually quantify like whether it's like worth implementing this AI application within my systems. Uh, two is how acute is this pain point, right? I think within all the different features like, like financial planning, accounting, fraud, payments risk, and all of those things, I would say fraud and payments risks are probably most top of mind right now. You have things like FedNow, ACH, RTP, Things could be transacted within a day and like those frauds are settled immediately. It's very, very hard to correct that after the fact. And three, lastly, what is your tolerance risk, right? Within financial services, if you report something wrong as a CFO, you can get fined by the, CF, uh, the SEC and there are downstream implications to the market. Or you think about something like insurance, you think something like underwriting, you cannot have a 95% confidence level, it needs to be 99.9. .9. And so if I think about all those different categories or the three categories, just ranked by like high, medium, low, it can give you a sense of which areas are looking to entertain AI applications, or maybe it's, a, where it's an area to start building in. And so I think in terms from my perspective, I think the two areas worth looking into right now are fraud and payments risk. And then lastly, I'll talk about some other financial planning, but um, within fraud and payments is for the reasons I mentioned, real tailwinds within legal and structural changes that are accelerating CFOs or CIOs to look for like how they can prepare for these downstream effects. I think something to also bear in mind is that if you look at applications like financial planning, like actually within the CFO suite, just because they have lower urgency does not mean that they're not looking at it. I think when you look at those like heat maps, you're like, oh, like maybe this area is an area I need to be spending time in. But it comes to the question is like, who are you building it for? If you're trying to be the next Anna plan, do more modeling, co-pilots, all those things, you need to be building those relationships with those buyers, if not years in advance. People are looking at it. It's harder to build, but I think there's also a lot of like lucrative opportunities within every single area of the finance stack. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well then let's turn our attention to one final question I have for you from trends to kind of news and really the biggest news item of the year there. I think, yeah, still fair, fair to say it still has been the biggest news item of the year in the financial world. And that was the SVB collapse, uh, earlier on this year. 
Did that event and kind of the industry reactions to it, one, surprise you in any ways? And then two, did it change any beliefs or the way of thinking that you or the firm has had from an investment perspective? Yeah, I think I would separate that one into more like existential, like tech investor existential, and more about like what it means for investments. I think if you've been on Twitter, I think the biggest surprise to me was the degree of animosity from the non-tech world towards tech, right? You deserve this. It's only startups. Why do I have, why do my tax dollars have to fund for like your bailout? But I don't think what people realize is that the 140 billion of outflows from SVB is not just venture-backed startups. It's life science companies. It's tech companies in growth stages. It's P backed. And sometimes it's even like consumers, right? They're private business. And so the scale is much bigger than I think most people or at least realize. And so all the second order effects have been discussed um, by VCs, news outlets and all those things. But I think about opportunities within this space. I think there are two areas that we have invested in. One is treasury management and two is more fixed income infrastructure. And so the reason why I talk about treasury management is Actually, we invested in this company even before SBB collapse, right? If you think about all the companies in terms of like enterprises from like Apple to mid-market and SMBs, all these large corporations have their own asset management arm. In fact, Apple's asset management arm is called Brayburn Capital, and some people even call it the world's largest hedge fund. And so they obviously have these resources and heads to make sure that they're investing their cash flows correctly because sometimes you know in airbnb's case in 2018 the cfo actually created a small hedge fund and turns out that hedge fund constituted 30 percent of their cash flows in 2018 and so it's not even just about cash flow preservation now you have this net new dollar where can you deploy that elsewhere to feed the machine and all that stuff is it has compounding effects but where we see the opportunity is mostly within the middle market in SMBs. And middle market, all separate SMBs like venture backed startups from the market, within middle market, I think there's approximately 2.6 trillion in idle cash. In venture backed startups, that's roughly $750 billion. And so these companies, for the most part, have not even thought about treasury management for the most part. People just figured out what 250 hey, FDIC, like just meant, right? It's completely unfeasible to actually like allocate 2 million of your do- um, dollars across eight different banks just to hit that 250K. It just doesn't make sense. So what is a solution for these startups and middle markets that do want to figure out how to invest their money more correctly? I think there's a lot of exciting startups that have been popping up. So we invested in Vesto, but there's also companies like Treasure Financial, uh, meow as well that essentially have been ha- handed like a Hail Mary um, from the SVB collapse. But it's really interesting because you could also even argue that treasury management is like the center, the epicenter for a lot of different financial workflows, whether it's like bank account reconciliation, cash flow forecasting, and all those different stuff. For middle markets and SVBs traditionally, most of that is just someone dealing wrestling different accounts, trying to tie everything together. No one really has like a full picture of where their cash is spent, where it's going to, and, you know, which high yield products do you invest in? And so a lot of attention has been given to the space, obviously in the past six months. Um, But I think something that'll be really interesting is to see once you do have the cash onboarded onto your product, if you are a founder, what do you do with that? Do you want to expand into adjacent products? So investing is one piece. Do you want to go to forecasting, FPN, and all those things? All that stuff is essentially greenfield, depending on who the buyer is and how core your product is to their workflow. So uh, a lot of exciting stuff still in the early stages, but that's one category. Um, And happy to talk about infrastructure as well, but I can go about this forever. 
Yeah. Uh, all, all very interesting stuff and definitely an industry that it, it never ceases to be interesting and seemingly continue to get more and more interesting by the day. Um, but this has been an amazing, uh, conversation, Megan, a real pleasure for those listening who may want to follow you or learn more about contrary, keep up with all you, the firm have going on or check out any new reports, uh, that are coming out, where would be the best place for them to go to do so? Uh, country.com. And awesome. I'm on Twitter as well. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Are we still, do we still call it Twitter? They haven't actually changed the name name yet. Right. Do we don't have to start saying X and tell getting people to understand what we mean? I don't think yet. Yeah. I, I'm still coming to terms with the logo and all those things. I will hold on to Twitter until it goes down. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think they're going to have to, because I think the number one question is what do we call a tweet if we don't call it a tweet? And if it, we don't call the tweet like it has to be Twitter to call the tweet. So I think uh, it's just going to be a new logo and not a new name uh, for the long haul, but that's another podcast for another day. Megan, it's been wonderful to have you. We will link to those and more. And again, those reports we discussed a little bit earlier, all of that will be in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your time and knowledge today. I've greatly enjoyed the conversation. Hope to speak to you again sometime soon. Awesome. Have a good one, Jacob. 